Hello, and welcome to the Flights of Fancy podcast, the podcast where we talk about military and combat aviation, past, present, and future. Today's episode will be the story of a small uh, middle child in a small, awkward family soon after its parents had divorced, while still trying to find its place in the world. The story begins, as with any new designer added to the list, of one Alexander Desiversky. Born in Georgia, no, not the state, in the year of 1894 in an, into a noble family. Mr. Desiversky had the good fortunes of a father who was one of the first people in Russia to own an aircraft, and this would help shape the future company owner, as his father taught him to fly. His service as naval aviator in the Russian Navy saw him living in the United States at the time of the Russian Revolution, and that very same conflict convinced him to stay in North America. His engineering background, gained at the Imperial Russian, Russian Naval Academy, and his love of aviation led to numerous inventions and patents, the sale of which helped fund his company, the Seversky Aero Corporation, in 1923. Unfortunately for Mr. De Seversky, the stock market crash of 1929 ended his company's chances at survival. A couple of years later, De Seversky was able to find funding thanks to the millionaire Edward Moore, as well as others, who allowed him to resurrect his old company under the new name of Seversky Aircraft Corporation. That same company developed the competitor to the P-36 in the P-35, an aircraft that sold only 200 examples to various nations. Once again, sadly for Mr. Desiversky, the company was losing money, and while he was away in Europe attempting to generate more sales for the company itself, the board had chosen to vote him out as president. On his return, the company was known as the Republic Aviation Corporation, and shortly thereafter, the company would develop the P-43 Lancer, as well as the P-47 Thunderbolt, creating a legacy that continues to this very day. For today, we'll be looking at the Republic P-43 Lancer. It was developed from the experience derived from the Sversky P-35 and the XP-41, itself an offshoot of the P-35, but instead with a two-stage supercharger. Now, some sources state that the XP-41 was developed around the same time as the P-43, then called the AP-4, while others claim that the former came before the latter. In either case, the basic design had promise, but the XP-41's version of it was not chosen for further development. The AP-4, on the other hand, would be selected for further testing, despite an engine fire that forced the pilot to bail out, resulting in a total loss of the aircraft. Now, uh, one thing to also, or two things to note about the XP-41, and the difference, or main difference, between it and the P-35, would be the addition of the two-stage supercharger, as well as the inward retracting landing gear. Now, when we're talking about inward retracting, we're talking specifically where it ends up uh, retracting back into, or towards, the fuselage or main frame of the aircraft, rather than straight back as seen on the P-35. Additionally, for those who are curious as to where exactly the supercharger is placed, or more specifically, the evidence and intake of it, is at the root of the left wing where it connects to the fuselage. And you can see it on the various diagrams. It's a little hard to see it on straight side shots, um, but generally speaking, there's enough of a bulge that you should be able to notice it. Now, this turbo supercharged design was enough to convince the United States Army Air Corps to invest in it, ordering 13 more in, in May 1939. Uh, we can see again as a uh, from from the side on both examples uh, the xp41 doesn't exactly uh, inspire new technology in the sense that it very much remains or retains the same sort of form and shape as seen on the p35 now the ordered uh, aircraft that the uh, usaac wanted to invest in would eventually be called the YP-43 and earn the moniker of Lancer. Among the biggest differences between prior Seversky and slash Republic aircraft would be this turbo supercharger and the large oval nose, caused by rearranging the air intakes under the engine. So instead of uh, having air intakes that may be under 
the uh, in the sort of chin installment or maybe under the fuselage or even in some designs where they might be under the wings uh, instead the entire setup is going to be uh, directly under the engine and giving it a very distinctive look the initial YP43 design had an R183035 twin WASP engine producing some 1,200 horsepower, four machine guns, two being in the nose and two in the wings, those being 50 cal in the, in the nose and 30 caliber in the wings. However, it lacked parts and implementations that were quickly becoming the norm for combat aircraft across the globe. The, that being self-sealing fuel tanks and armor were either missing or simply lacking. Furthermore, complaints were leveled at its lack of maneuverability, something that by 1940 was a more pressing concern than speed. And despite having been ordered in the first half of 1939, none of them were built and delivered until September 1940, and the last of these 13 didn't arrive until April 1941. Under normal circumstances, the story would have ended here. Why? Well, there was an up-and-comer in the works from Republic, the P-47 Thunderbolt. It was an enormous fighter that would earn a marvelous reputation, except that the engine it required was not ready for it. The 13 YP-43s were supplemented by an order for some 50 when that design was still desirable. Because of the power plant issues for the developing P-47, the Army ordered a further 80 P-43s with an upgraded twin WASP engine, two 50 cal machine guns replacing the 30 cals in the wings, and, under some circumstances, cockpit armor. Later, another order, this time for 125 examples, carrying the designation of P-43A1, uh, this new ver uh, version carried the same intentions as the last, keep Republic busy. The new version featured self-sealing fuel tanks and armor, as well as hard points for six 20-pound bombs or two 200-pound bombs. Many of these P-43As would see service with the Chinese Air Force. Interestingly, the P-43, thanks to its engine and supercharger arrangement, uh, was a good high-altitude fighter, but wasn't seen as competent enough by U.S. standards uh, to be used. By 1942, the designation had been made to restrict them, or the uh, decision had been made to restrict them to training flights, with some being converted to photo reconnaissance versions, uh, namely the P-43B, P-43C, P-43D, and P-43E. All different, but realistically all the same as well. The major difference between all the versions are simply that the camera uh, and equipment were positioned in different uh, spots. Now, I say, I, I have to add a little asterisk here, namely that um, there's no concrete evidence on my part to specifically locate where the, the different versions of all the camera installments. This isn't to say that it doesn't exist or, or isn't possible to exist. Uh, more specifically, I just haven't seen any concrete uh, documentation that reveals the four different variations. Um, in this slide, we can see that uh, I'm simply taking a P-43 Lancer as it would have likely been used uh, in the skies above China and uh, versus a known enemy unit that it would have likely uh, come across, the Ki-43 2B Hayabusa. Now, I picked the 2B as it's pretty close to the same time that the P-43 would have been used uh, in China, so it's relatively close in deployment times. We can see that the Hayabusa lacks a lot in terms of machine guns uh, and forward firepower, while the Lancer has a uh, larger size or higher weight, and uh, despite those two qualities, uh, still manages to have a higher top speed as well as a higher service ceiling, even though it has to give some leeway in terms of range. Now, another thing I found uh, rather interesting about the P-43 was that it has some sort of warning horn, which, uh, as stated in the, uh, the excerpt from the manual, um, 
If the throttle lever is moved towards the closed position when the landing gear is not in position for landing, uh, a horn will sound off. To disconnect the horn from a long glide with the wheels up, trip the switch release where it engages the throttle control rod. When the throttle is open, the catch will re-engage, sounding the horn when the throttle is again moved towards the closed position. Now, we can also see uh, a similar arrangement to a lot of uh, early fighters, especially the ones that had uh, guns in the nose. There's the specific cutout where the machine guns are, and this is essentially just in order to clear jams. You have uh, the ability for the pilot to uh, recock the guns. As mentioned, the P-43 was more of a stopgap solution when it comes to Republic Aviation's uh, desires for, well, uh, cash and just survival in terms of a company. Um, we can also see that the original P-47s had a lot of the same sort of design influences that would be seen from the P-43 and itself being from having the same sort of inspiration from the XP-41 and again itself from P, the P-35. Now, uh, I don't want to go too far into the P-47 uh, rabbit hole, but this is more to, to show off one, the design influences and the fact that um, as, the, uh, as the war developed, the P-47 itself would be changed in order to reflect those modifications or those uh, increasing uh, needs. Um, specifically, the cockpit arrangement just didn't work, or at least was not satisfactory, and so they changed to the bubble canopy. Um, and we also see just the inspiration for uh, large radial engines. And uh, despite not being able to really see it in the uh, in a side profile, uh, they do. Um, uh, if you look at these all from the nose, they'll all have the same distinct oval shape. Now, as mentioned, the P-43 did serve uh, in China, and it was used by the Chinese National Air Force, and as well as a few other countries, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a few other countries, namely the Royal Australian Air Force. Now, the RAAF uh, used them similarly to the uh, to the Americans in that as soon as they were they were brought on. Um, they didn't really appeal all that much to uh, to being used in combat situations and would typically see themselves being used as photo reconnaissance. We can also see that um, while this is mentioned as a P-43A1, or at least converted from one, um, we can see that there is a giant hole in the frame, and this is where one of the cameras would be set up. And sadly, there's not much else in terms of uh, uh, photos, at least not for this aircraft specifically, in order to get a, a better idea as to uh, what version it might have been compared to others and how it would have specifically had cameras installed. We can also see that the supercharger is still intact and that the, uh, the main mechanism uh, visible would be you know, the exhaust and the uh, the turbo supercharger pointing, uh, poking out from the underside of the, uh, the frame. Now, thankfully, it was able to find this image, which does show a P-43 having a camera loaded. We can see the uh, incredible size of the cameras, the lenses required to... Uh, essentially take photos at such high resolution from such high altitude and being able to develop them in a way that they could be used. Now, again, we can see the door that was used, so you get a, a good idea as to, one, how large this aircraft is. Kind of also gives an idea as to how empty planes are in their frames, um, at least that is when they're not filled with a huge engine, when they don't have a firewall, machine guns in them, and ammo, and fuel, oil, and so on and so forth. 
Now, most P43s observed the same sort of uh, camouflage patterns. None of them ever sported anything too crazy as far as I can tell. And we have two examples of Chinese aircraft uh, in the traditional uh, color schemes. We also have yet another image of A565. Additionally, there's a few photos here from uh, directly of the Chinese pilots. Um, there's sadly not too much information, at least in English sources, uh, regarding their experiences. It seems that the general appeal of the P-43 Lancer, especially in U.S. airman hands, wasn't all that favorable as mentioned previously. The aircraft was used and did have several flights against enemy combatants, um, but generally speaking, it just didn't make any sort of impact. The lack of armored self-sealing fuel tanks didn't help as well, as not all of the aircraft that made it into China, or at least in the Chinese theater, and that didn't exactly have um, all of the same modifications made to them, and that includes the armor packs that uh, were supposed to be installed. Now, what this means is that the P-43 would sometimes be shot at, uh, well, obviously in combat situations, and because of its lack of armor, or at least self-sealing fuel tanks, it did mean that uh, when it did catch fire, which appeared to be more than, uh, than acceptable, um, you typically wouldn't have any way to restore control of the aircraft. Despite all this, the Chinese were in a way desperate for aircraft and would take anything that they could get. And the P-43 is one example of uh, such a desperate uh, need. Now, interestingly, this also leads to a discovery that I had found thanks to uh, some other documentation that I just happened to come across, uh, which relates in a way specifically to the P-43, namely the uh, U.S. blood chit. Now, the U.S. blood chit seems to be or to have been a uh, means of um, displaying the nationality of the pilot as well as the uh, cause under which they were fighting for. Specifically, the any pilot with a blood chit uh, either sewn on their jacket on the back, some of them had them sewn on the inside of their, their jackets and so on, um, the message all follows the same sort of script, essentially telling uh, any Chinese national that the person wearing that garb or, or uh, uniform is there to, in fact, fight the, China, the Japanese, and that any effort should be made in order to return them safely. Now, there has been evidence that I could see that this also applied to British soldiers, or British airmen, I should say, um, and presumably this also applied to any other nationality that may have flown uh, in, the, uh, in those same areas. And lastly, uh, or at least uh, prior to lastly, there is one or two other things I'd like to show off. Firstly, this gives a really good idea as to the underside of the aircraft. Um, again, I don't have a really good idea as to what modification this is. Um, it seems that the sides on this aircraft, which show where the camera is pointing, doesn't really 100% coincide with the um, the installation that the Australian aircraft had. And so it's hard to really determine uh, which version is which. Um, having a partial uh, um, airframe code also doesn't help, especially since it's the start and not the end. That being said though, we can see once more just the sort of installation that existed and having the exposed pipe in order to uh, help with cooling. And lastly, 
The P-43 did have one offshoot that was uh, attempted to be developed, namely the P-44 and the P-44-2. Uh, both of these would earn the same moniker, the Rocket, and it was only slightly different to uh, the P-43. Now, technically it's more a variant of the AP-4, but uh, regardless, the P-44 was planned to use a 1400 Twin Hornet engine. Um, it was supposed to replace the P-43. As mentioned, they weren't really, uh, they were nonplussed by the P-43's performance. And so when Republic or Seversky, depending on who you, who you attribute uh, the company name um, or ownership of the design to, uh, the P-44 was projected, it was announced, and the uh, U.S. Army Air Corps decided they were going to go all in on it. It sounded like a really good idea, and then it was going to generally outperform the P-43 to such a high degree that uh, we were almost certain we should, we should scrap the P-43. And so uh, an order comes in for 80 of them. The, uh, while the order comes in and they're working on tooling and all that sort of stuff, they... Uh, they find that they can refine the P-44 even further, earning the Dash 2 name. They plan to use a 2000 double WASP, which is different from a twin WASP engine. Um, it was projected to be a high altitude fighter, which is what the P-43 technically was. It just wasn't used in large numbers and wasn't all that effective at it. So much so was the uh, impression that the... Um, USAAC had of the aircraft that he'd ordered 827 of them. And as uh, as seen on screen, the order for 827 examples was around the time of the 9th of September 1940, and four days later, all of them are canceled because the P-47 was revealed, and the uh, United States decides that that's a is a much more um, enticing project to go with. And so with that, as a despite being a slightly shorter episode, uh, that ends up being all there is on the P-43 Lancer. I would like to mention that uh, the Joe Bauer and Warbird Forum um, links are very useful, and if anybody is interested in more personal stories or um, a little bit more in depth as to how the P-43 was used, specifically in China, uh, I definitely recommend checking out those two links. Uh, as well, um, I do want to shout out, uh, as always, the uh, Twitter and the Patreon, and thanks for everybody who's been uh, patiently waiting for this newest uh, episode. Uh, in the future, I should be able to get some done a little bit faster. Uh, unfortunately, I had some issues with the program I was using uh, to the point where I kind of had to restart this from scratch. So apologies if it's a little rough around the edges. In any case, that will be it for today, and I will see you all next time.